Hello and welcome to another BAFTA Live online Q&A. My name is Ian Hayden-Smith and just to give you a little bit of information before we start this event, um, today the event won't be closed captioned but when this interview is put up on BAFTA's YouTube site there will be subtitles available for you to watch the film with. Also as is always the case with BAFTA events um, we encourage you to send in questions for those who've seen the film and enjoyed it um, that I will then ask our guests today. The Mole Agent is a fascinating documentary that starts out as a cross between a hard-boiled 1940s detective thriller um, with elements of noir in which abuse is believed to be taking place at a care home and requires an undercover agent to go in and investigate. That's before the film transforms into a moving portrait of loneliness and the aging process. And at its heart is a cinematic everyman, Sergio Chami, whose humanism and genuine affection for the people steers the course of this story. I'm delighted to welcome the director of the film, Maita Albedi. Hello, Maita. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, Hi, how are, are you? you? Hi. Um, also delighted to welcome the producer of the film, Marcella Santibanez. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi, yeah. Good, thank you. And also the three executive producers on the film, Carolyn Hepburn, Julie Goldman, and Christopher Clements. Hello to you all. Hello. Hi. Okay, um, I want to start, Marta, with you. Um, looking back on your career as a whole, your previous filming in educational and care institutions with films like I'm Not Here and The Grown Ups, it struck me that that might have sparked an interest that led to the making of The Mole Agent. Was that the case? Yeah, I think it's an interest uh, interested in isolation in general and in people that it's dependent in society and how these dependent people at the end, at least in Latin American societies, are understanding to be in another place and not completely integrate to uh, the life of communities. So I think that that three films at least have that in common. I think more than to speak about, you put a good point, for me it's more that uh, the point in common to, that to see that it's about old age, my interest in, because uh, I think that old age are a lot of ways to lead the old aging process and the mole agent, it's an example of that also. It's completely an interest in how some groups are completely out of society, yeah. But um, it's interesting to see the way the film progresses uh, in that direction. And, and one of the pleasures for me was actually not knowing anything about the film uh, when I first started watching it. Um, and, and so I'm first of all immersed in this world of the private detective, uh, Romulo Aitken. Um, now I know that he'd had experience, well, he's an ex-police officer, isn't he? And he's had experience with four cases of investigating nursing homes. Um, was it through those cases or hearing about those cases that, that you met him? I have, yeah, it was exactly as, do you say, like I, also finished in a film that I didn't expect. I was expecting to make a film about a private detective. I am end in a film that it's more similar to my previous film about these institutions because my first goal was to make a film about a private detective. Um, I rehearsed all the cases that he had. I worked as his assistant for a while. I worked a couple of months with him and I understand this world. I attend a lot of clients and I saw these cases that he worked with moles in retirement homes and was my uh, interested because it was um, unbelievable for me that kind of, of situation and of research. And that was the starting point of the film. But at the beginning, the film was completely more focused in the case. Uh, also, when I was shooting, my my main concern was to make the structure of this uh, crime or this um, narrative uh, detective film noir, but we realized that the motion was not there, it was completely in the travel that Sergio lives inside the home. So that was like how it 
a film that changed when we were making it in the focus, I think. I mean, just, there's, there's that um, famous Hitchcock saying about when you're making a feature film, uh, the director is God, and when you're making a documentary, God is the director. You have no control over what's happening. In, in the process of, of making this film and realizing it was going to be something different to what you originally thought it was, is, is, is that a moment that's quite exciting or is it also a mixture of, sort of a mixture of excitement and something nerve wracking? Yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, we decided like the main, or oh, the world that we wanted to shoot, the characters that we wanted to shoot, but at the end we were completely follow something that in some point was not depending for us because inside the retirement home, we don't have any control. We have to act that we didn't know him. So we, I cannot direct him and I cannot give any order to the Malayan inside the home. I can, so, and we were making a documentary and they knew that inside the retirement home. So we were completely following that reality and let us surprising all the time with what was happening then. Probably I have more like, or I had control in the instructions that Romulo gave to him because as I worked with him as his assistant before I knew which kind of instructions he were going to receive. So I were more prepared for the process, but not for the result of that uh, researching process. So yeah, I was, it was surprising uh, all the time. And with a lot of things that surprise us that they're not on the film neither. Like for example, at the third day, Sergio wanted to go home, back home. And it was like, what can we do? Like we already shoot like all the training, all the film and he doesn't want to continue with this job. Like, and as we were like acting inside the retirement home that we don't, don't know him, we can't, uh, we can't shoot that. So there are a lot of things that we neither can shoot that probably were good for the film. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, God was the director in some point of some <laughs> situations that happened, <laughs> of course. So Marcella, um, at what point did you come on board with the film? Um, well, we actually went to film school together with Maite, so we know each other for a while. Um, and uh, we worked together in 2015 for the Goya campaign of her film Tea Time. That was the first time that we actually worked together. And then after that, Maite said, like, I have this crazy project. How does it sound? Would you like to uh, join me in this adventure? So uh, at the end of 2015 and 2016, I, I joined and then we started working together. And as a, as a producer, how easy was it to, to bring this together? <laughs> and not at all. It was quite complicated, actually, but it was, uh, I think, more than complicated, it was more like very challenging because uh, all the, there were no written rules. I think we had to like create all the rules in a way. Uh, we, we had no idea of nothing, you know, how to, how to embrace this crazy idea that Maite was uh, you know, visioning, but then we had to figure out how to make it real. So uh, how to, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, go to the nursing home and don't tell them what we were actually doing, how to, you know, embrace the relationship with Sergio, how to uh, tell afterwards the truth. And then while, while we were shooting challenges, like what Maite just said, you know, we are working with, with real life, so anything could happen. So it was a lot about also going day by day and, and reacting day by day and, and, finding the, and finding the problems and finding the solutions. But I don't know, the, the, we always uh, laughed that the making of the film would have been a really good film too because <laughs> the whole process has been really like a, a huge adventure. It's been entertaining. <laughs> So, Carolyn, um, Julian, Christopher, uh, you head up Motto Pictures, which has been responsible for such a fantastic array of award-winning non-fiction and documentary films over the last few years. Um, 
just can each of you talk about what it was that uh, attracted you to this project? I'll start with you, Carol. Um, I think f kind of f first, I could probably talk for Julie and Chris, it's like we were all just huge fans of Mighty's previous films. Uh, you know, I, I love The Grown Ups and Tea Time and kind of how she tackled those subject matters and, you know, this kind of very impactful and graceful way. And, um, and you know, when, when Marcella MIT pitched this project, it was just kind of so ingenious and, um, you know, just kind of um, their sensibilities of how they were, wanted to go about it just kind of was inventive, but very at the same time, you know, they were concerned with, you know, how they were going to deal with Sergio and, 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 the, and the community and, um, you know, just kind of, it just kind of felt kind of very easy and natural in, in a lot of ways of how they were going to approach it and just found the whole concept of the film just kind of ingenious, you know, so it was kind of a big leap of faith that the right spy would be cast, you know, and that he would be engaging and as, you know, I mean, that was God completely because Sergio, <laughs> there is no better kind of spy than Sergio for this movie, but... Uh, Even his but, jawline is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. It's yes. got the film star looks. Yes. The other thing is, I mean, there was another, his regular mole broke his hip. And that's, that's why, why they had the casting. Yeah. yeah. Which was fortunate for the film. I think that's probably one of the most attractive things was the unknown. That basically, Maite wanted to do a thing that was film noir at first. And we thought, for the longest time, we thought that finding out if the place was a safe place was the film. And there was a seminal moment where we were in the edit and Maite was just like, it's about the relationships. It's not about like there, there was petty theft and stuff like that. But like that's having the elastic creative perspective to say we no longer have to be slaves to this anymore. Yes, we have the feel of it being a noir, but we're going to follow the thing that really has yeah. like a pulse to it that has a, has life in it. And the whole romance thing was a surprise. Oh, Good yeah. God, nobody expected that. <laughs> And I, want, I want to, sorry, it was, please. It was like, you know, people with Alzheimer's. It wasn't like there was any nefarious intent. You right. Know, it was like somebody who would take something and forget about it. And for a while we were trying to build a story where here's the criminal, but it was such a paltry criminal. <laughs> yeah. <And> so, <laughs> you know, you know, Maite and Marcella just shifted. Um, you were mentioning about the, the noir element of it um, and also the fact that there was originally a private investigator who uh, broke his hip. I've got a question here from uh, Victor Schoenfeld. Just about how much of the beginning, the setup of the spy interviews and training was dramatic reenactment or had been scripted? Nothing scripted, uh, but um, my yeah, my take should speak to it. It was more of a mechanical shooting thing, but... Yeah, it was nothing was scripted. We study a lot our uh, film reference in the photography of the style, and we wanted to work a lot of, on study how to imitate that in the visual aspect. And um, and we in some way had the opportunity with this training to shoot a lot of takes of each scene because. For Romulo, it takes a lot of time to explain to Sergio each situation. Like, for example, the phone uh, scene, that it's like two minutes on the film, uh, in the reality was like one day and a half. So we have time to move, to put the uh, perfect shot and to uh, do everything. Of course, that I speak a lot with Romulo, which kind of training he was going to do to Sergio, but Sergio was completely in his job, not in my film. So for us, uh, he was leaving his training and I cannot stop that or I cannot give an instruction. Also, because if I did that inside the office, I will have to do the same in the retirement home. And in the retirement home, I needed him acting that he didn't, doesn't know me. So if I did that mood before, he were going to be uh, acostumbrado, get used 
to my presence, like interacting. So I try to don't interact. I speak a lot with Romulo before which step of the training we, are, we were going to have and we, uh, which step I wanted to shoot because there were some rehearsals, for example, in the streets that I didn't shoot or we shoot one that, that, that at okay. the end are not in the film. But I was super coordinating and I have a script that it's for me, I always say it's more like a shopping list. Like I knew which were the steps and I say, okay, the scene of the phone, okay, we have that training. Or the moment that he explained what is the mission, okay, I have it. But uh, it was not uh, a script that, that Sergio or Romulo were like acting or, or waiting for instruction. Yeah. And of course, that we're, we work a lot in the office to put the things in the space in a way that, that work for the camera. I think that that was the most constructed scene in that uh, setting, like was the object, because as we decide to shoot in a film noir way, it was the first time of all my films that we use an open lens that was an 18. And with the 18, you see everything. You see until like the everything. So we really needed to put like the things in a way that you can uh, not see like wide walls, like to construct that space. Like that was like, I think that the more fiction things that we do in that place, but was everything before that Sergio enter and everything uh, like, prepared for that, yeah. And, that, and the set material, Rolo had all that material there, which was right. like, it was more like kind of like using it. This was stuff he's accumulated over his entire career that he identifies with. So it kind of gave his character. Where sure, sure. It, was, it was that funny thing. It, it, it reminded me of two things seeing that opening. Uh, one of the opening of, again, coming back to Hitchcock, Rear Window, where you get the shot around Jane Stewart's bedroom and you, everything you need to know about his character is in that. But also the pinboard of the usual suspects, where it's like all these things on it. And the moment the camera cuts to um, the desk of files and you have one with confidential written on it, I thought this is priceless. If this guy actually has a file that says confidential and he's a private investigator, but that's just brilliant. <laughs> it's just, what a wonderful guy. Um, I also, uh, before we move on to, to the kind of more serious element of, of the film, um, so one of the other aspects of the film that I think, um, as well as the brilliant editing and the directing of, of all these different elements, one of the things that brings everything together so well is Vincent van Wormerdam's music, because you do have this very noir, playful noir-like element at the beginning. But, but then it takes you through um, to the later stages. Um, could you talk a little bit about the conversations you had with him and how far in advance he was composing or whether he was composing just for finished film? Yeah, it was completely a big challenge, the music, because it was the only element of film noir that I can maintain during all the film. So because when I enter to the retirement home, I have less control of the lights. I cannot put them. I use it only when he was writing his reports and that it's more similar of the office in a visual way. So the music was my element of my reference as, um, of the film that is the startup or the invitation that is this film noir and, and you it's the, the thing that brings you back to the beginning in some point, the music. It's like Romulo, the music. It's like it's give, giving you back all the time to what were our starting point for me. And with Vincent, uh, he's like, I, we spoke about the film noir uh, reference that we love and he was completely free of, uh, create in his own way. He was not like creating for the scene. It was like emotion and reference, and we work with that uh, material, yeah. And just was Romulo happy with the whole idea of the film? Because it struck me that this is, he suddenly put, he has a public image now. And I wondered how that works in terms of his everyday job. 
Yeah, until now, I think that I really cannot understand why Romulo say yes. Uh, uh, because I, I, I went to a lot of private detective office at the beginning when I was making the research. I called all the private detective office in Chile that are a lot, and I make a lot of interviews, but nobody of them allows me to enter and shoot. And Romulo for the beginning was like, okay, let's see how can we do it. Like, let's enter and you had to research and see. And, and we construct together with Romulo, like the way to shoot this film without, uh, como digo, arruinar, Marcel? Without, um, without ruining or messing up. I don't know. Messing up the case. Uh, mm. uh, what It's what we were going to say to the retirement home uh, to don't ruin the case and at the same time for him was like okay but you were his concern was like you were going to be with a camera inside the place so my case is not going to work because they are going to behave very well because you are with a camera there so we say like okay but we were not shooting all days so Sergio is going to be alone also so he can research alone when we were will be not shooting so they cannot be behaving well 24 hours, seven days per week. Like mm. when the camera is not there, you can see what is happening. So, uh, but there was kind of dialogues that we have in a super open way with Romulo to find the idea of the film and to find also like which kind of case we really can shoot and which one were impossible to shoot, for example. I want to move on to, to the home itself now, and I've got a question here from Alan Stewart, and he asks, on what basis did you in initially manage to get permission from the care home to film the event? Marce? You want me to? Yeah. Um, well, the good thing is that Maite, this is her fourth film, and in her previous films, she has uh, worked with old age before, so she is like well known in Chile. So the first thing that really helped us was that we went to the retirement home and we told them we want to make a film about, about this place, about old age, and we want to observe and be here. And they all were very excited. We showed them Maite's previous films. We had a, a conversation, everybody agreed. But then we, when we said we want to have like special focus, if anybody new arrives, we would like to see, you know, have spe special focus because somebody new always help in like understanding the place is the first time that they arrive, you know, so it was perfect for like a story arc. And then when we were already shooting there, we were like three weeks already inside the retirement home, Sergio arrived. And we were like, oh, this guy is great. We are gonna put like special focus on this guy. And so they never really knew that Sergio was our protagonist. I mean, they knew we wanted to put special focus, but they never knew that we knew him uh, in advance. And then uh, what was complicated for us was the moment when we had to actually tell them like the name of the film, it's called The Mole Legend. Why it's called The Mole Legend if it's about the retirement home? And that actually happened right before our premiere in Sundance. The first people that watched the final version of the film was the retirement home, like the director and the people that we work with. And we had a meeting with them, uh, me and Maite and them, and we told them like, okay, we have, we have some news. Uh, the film is actually about a private detective. Uh, it's a spy and they were very nervous. And we said like, but don't, don't worry, like watch it. Uh, we kind of knew, you sense that the place probably nothing happened in advance. Like, of course we didn't know. And if anything bad happened, they knew that we were going to shoot the good things, the bad things everywhere. So, but we kind of perceived that probably, probably, there was nothing wrong but then when 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 it actually happened actually for that it was kind of relieving to know that that the place was was really nice and then when they saw the film and they loved the film and they cried and they laughed we felt much more you know a big weight was lifted and and they were very excited and then we were like okay we we did a good job but it was very nerve-wracking until that moment but they loved the film did you, did you have a sort of 
a worst case scenario in that what if Sergio had discovered that they were guilty of malpractice? Did you have discussions in advance of even discussing what the legal situation might be there? Yeah, we, we yeah. take care a lot about the legal side uh, yeah. before, like, and we were expecting to find a crime or something yeah. uh, not good that we, we were with the prejudge also of yeah. that place. And yeah. At the beginning, Marcela and I, we didn't felt so guilt to were lying to the place because we hoped that something, or we thought that something bad was happening. So we yeah. were like, digo denunciando, like showing something bad that was important to show. But our guilt started to be when we realized that that was a good place and we have really to build this good place because we didn't find nothing bad. Uh, mm. So that was our like moral complaint at, at, in the in the middle of the of the shooting like more than before that we were expecting to make another kind of result in the investigation of the film yeah so yeah. and sorry yes no please and one small thing to add for example in in my test short film uh, i'm not from here there is a scene where like uh, an old lady falls in the floor and, and it's very harsh. And for example, we show that short film to the retirement home and we wanted to make them like know that we were going to show everything, like the good things and the bad things. So there, there was like, we, we wanted to put the rules in advance so then they wouldn't say like, don't show this or don't show that, you know? And also with the people, we told them, we invite you to be in the film, but if you'd rather not be in the film, just don't sign the agreement and you won't appear in the film. So we wanted to make sure legally that the rules were there clear so we wouldn't be like betraying them or anything in the, in the way, you know? And legally, we knew that if something bad happened in Sergio's camera, we cannot show it because mm. it was not legal because we don't we didn't have that permission. That was the, okay. the our lawyers told us like if my camera sees something, we can show it. But if not, Sergio can say it in a report or in something. But I can never use Romulo's private material to show a crime. And just in, in the process of filming and realizing that the film is not, as you're filming, it, it, it's not turning out to be the thing that you thought it was. Um, did that have an impact on the material you'd already shot? And, and how much did you change with your direction and with what you were doing um, within the care home? Eh, sorry, Marce, ¿cuánto cambió de...? Como lo que pensabas que iba a ser, sí, de como a medida que fue ocurriendo, como no fue lo que tú esperabas y cómo fue cambiando la película. Yeah, it changed a lot in, in the focus, I think. Like, for me, it was like the case, and then it was like not the case, it was the Sergio traveling, and also in the style, because there are things, for example, of the crew appearing on the film, that was a decision that we take in the editing because I never thought in that, but, but it was really important to explain how we enter and uh, how we explain to the retirement home so you can understand that and then you enter to the film. But I think that I never, because when I made the research, I made it with the previous mold that Romulo had, the one that broke his hip. And he was not so touching as Sergio, so I was not expecting that aspect, really. And um, when Sergio appears, that was the best gift for me and for the film, because he was really open to experience. So being open to experience, it's like as a filmmaker, if I'm a documentary filmmaker, I'm open to experience, I'm going to see more things. So he started to live more things, Things that a classical mall concerned about his job, and he was like leaving his job and starting to live in his life. So, in I think that Sergio's personality 
give me the change of the film and on the focus at the end because it was completely what was happening to him because he was open to leave. Uh, Oscar, the previous mole of Romulo, will never do that. He was going to be super focused in the case. So that was where I was expecting. Yeah. So Chris, and Julian, and sorry, go ahead, please. No, no. And I think that for the same reason, the film became much more emotional, probably, than what we were expecting, because he was such an emotional character. Yeah. I, 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 that was going to be what I wanted to ask uh, Chris, Julie and Carolyn about um, Sergio as a character. And obviously there, there are some films that travel very well, other films less so. But there is something about Sergio's character and this universality and the emotion that he brings to it. Is that something that you guys immediately identified with and, and thought this is something that has a much wider appeal? We, we watched the long cut of the interviews there are a lot of people who, who like that's a short sequence, but there are a lot of different characters of the, um, of the for the casting yeah. for the mole. And Sergio stood out. There were a few others that were funny and had edges to them, but um, I think we all gravitated toward him. And we were just fortunate that that Romolo was like, yeah, I could see working with you him. You know, too. I mean, Sergio yeah. was so emotionally open. And, you know, that's it. You know, you have somebody like that who you can, he's, he is exactly who he is. There's no pretense. There's, he is an emotional person. I mean, he, there were many more scenes where he cried <laughs> in different cuts of the film. He's an emotional guy, but that's like, to have empathy. that accessibility and the empathy and the kindness, you could just, it just radiated from him from the beginning. And we were like, oh my God, like, you know, you watch him and you're like, I want, I wish this was my grandfather. You know, like that feeling is a, is a pretty powerful thing. He's a type of character who you could tell listens and takes in what he's hearing. And then whatever he gives back is a deliberative, well-reasoned humanity. It just communicated. And his biggest gift too, is that he opened the other people in the home you know, that where they most likely would have been kind of more closed or guarded. But, you know, you just kind of can't help but love him. <laughs> and so all these ladies, you know, uh, on different levels would open up to him. And it was just kind of beautiful to, to see and really drove the film home. I mean, just to, for each of you, um, is, is there, is there, was there a specific moment? It may not be in the film. It may be uh, one of the antics that that really struck you because it was funny watching the film for me, the moment that I realized the film had got me completely is when you have the three women sat on the bench and the one is trying to get the other one's attention with her hand ever so subtly, but not subtle. And that, <laughs> I just realized that you've got me. I, I just love this. Um, I just, I'm just wondering for each of you, was there a specific moment? Let's oh, Caroline, start with you. Well, going through the, when Bertha was going through, Bertita was going, counting the petals. <laughs> you know, he loves me, he loves me that. You knew this was ending on, he loves me, no matter what petal was there. And things like that, or, or like the emotional moment when, you know, when, when Sergio says, you know, you can cry, you can let go, like things like that, that just, that stays with me, especially these days, that really stays with me as like that, that you know, let go and being able to, to actually say that to somebody and give them that release. So those are, you know. And very quickly, there's, there was the moment when he goes into the, the rooms where they, people are really laid up. Uh, what I thought that was interesting about that, what moved me with that was that you could tell in Sergio, he's like, this is beyond the pale for me. I can't do anything with this. I can't help this. And so it gave you a sense of the range, his, his empathy and his ability to connect with people was stopped there because he couldn't connect with them, but he still felt for them and he thought it through. But that to me was a kind of a watershed moment. And uh, what about you, Carolyn? Um, I, well, I love, you know, when he first arrives and he, he goes to lunch and all the women are, you know, <laughs> clucking, <laughs> you know, basically. New guy on the block. Them and, and prospects. I, I just, you know, that just kills me. And um, and one of my favorite scenes is uh, his birthday scene when Marta's sitting next to him singing along to the song for him. 
I mean, Julie and Chris would, can account that, like, I would go around our office singing that song constantly because I just loved, you know, just the way she's looking at him and how emotional he was and the, just, like, a beautiful song. I, I was constant, that song was constantly in my head and I was singing it <laughs> around the office. Much other. Much other. I think for me, it was it's not in a specific moment, but it was his uh, relationship with Marta, because I think that he came very much like uh, to do a job. You know, he was focused on on doing a good job, and and I think at the beginning he never expected to actually like have a friend inside, and for us it was very special because although Marta and Soila where like they were really like they have advanced Alzheimer's and they never remembered anything. We never expected that they would become their best friends and they actually did become their best friends and he spent it all day with them and he had fun with them and he was happy. So there was this whole idea that, that at the beginning he found everything like too old for him. And then at some point they like, oldest or craziest or like more dementia ladies became they really became uh, his best friends and the he was like very touched emotionally very touched of of like leaving them uh, he really misses them so i think that 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 whole like story arc with them and for me uh, like we never expected to have him like have that type of relationship and for me, it's what like struck me the most and felt like oh, this is real, you know, this is special. And Michael, with you, just a slightly different uh, question. Was there, a, was there a specific moment where you suddenly thought, oh yeah, I've got it. I, I, this is, I know I, I've really got something here. There are so many also, but <laughs> no, I feel that for like a stomach feeling when you I you are shooting that you say like oh no it's like the birthday that were, when he was like dancing with everybody and it was like I cannot believe this because you were not expecting this and it's completely crazy and even if I script write this it, it's, it's not possible so that moment for me was whoa, well, and the moment when when he gives gave the photos to Rubira when he asked the photos to Romulo, and we see that Rubira recognized their family was so heartbreaking, and for me it was so perfect because it was the match between the investigation, but he take his own investigation, the topic of the film, and the feeling of that relationship that. For me, it's like was wow, uh, and it was super painful for me to shoot that moment. Also, yeah, um, I get a sense from all of you talking that there was probably a huge amount of footage actually shot. Um, could you talk a little bit about how much was shot and how much of a challenge the actual editing process was? Well, Car there's yeah, an Carolina. amazing Carolina. Um, Carolina's yeah. Carolina an amazing editor, but go go ahead, yeah. my babe. It was a challenge. Yeah, we have the best editor in the world, Carolina. We have 300 hours. And it, I, for me, the quantity, it's not so much. I usually work with 300 hours. For me, the point of this film that was too many lines possible and too many characters. So it was not the quantity of material, it was the quantity of possibilities yeah. of construction in that material. It's uh, lineal, how choral, how many second characters of the place do you have, how is the balance between the case and the retirement home, um, where to start at the beginning was only the office and then we make this flash forward to the, to the retirement home. So there were so many questions of the script at the editing that it's the first time that I had really a lot of possibilities to make different films in the editing. That, that, that was the challenge. And I always say that I'm super grateful to have uh, these producers and all the co-producers of the film because it was really a United Nations meeting of, in the Rafkat editing room to see the opinions. And I think that 
all of us work to make a more universal film because everybody put input in that editing that for me was super creative and in some point the documentary co-production it's different on fiction because on fiction you have the artistic crew in the shooting and in documentary you you never have that because they cannot have a camera person of the United States, for example, because it's like two years living in Santiago. But in this case, I, f I really feel the power of the co-production in a creative way in the editing because I really appreciate that input because make it more creative and powerful because all each of the producers have a different idea that make the film improve or have a question to discuss. So it was like an amazing process in that way, not only with the editor, that of course that was super great, but also in the dialogue, yeah. I just, uh, yes, please. I like to liken it to, in a way, it's almost like wildlife photography, what this would involve, because it took that kind of patience you, you, Maite wasn't in a bird blind, she was there with her camera, but there were places where they would congregate around this space that she discerned, and you set the camera up for three hours, and you sometimes some, you're on, you're off, you know something's going to happen then, because usually around this time, there's an interaction between these characters and those characters, and you're really waiting for it to happen, and then all of those options, we worked with Carolina, and, and Maite worked with Carolina, and they they dove in and, and you have to then discern and say, this doesn't look like very much here, but this is relevant to other things with these two characters previously. And that's where the editing really becomes rich. When you start to really mine a lot of kind of footage that really ends up on the floor, as you say, it's not, it was never gonna make it into the film, but you needed to shoot that much in order to find these little moments. And there's an elasticity to the, mm -hmm. to the process because of my play, Marcel and Carolina being really open. Yes. A lot of times when you're working, it's like a, there's like a iron wall between, you know, that you feel um, this was the opposite of that. And it, it just, you know, was, it really yeah. was like a, a total, like inclusive creative thought. I think it was, they invited us into. and it was because we all defined our terms. Everybody understood what everyone was thinking when they were advocating for, to go one way or another. So that way, if you chose to do it or you didn't choose to do it, it was a, everyone was cognizant of why we were going down this avenue and not that avenue. Um, we're almost down to time. Just a couple more questions. Um, first of all, Sergio's reaction to the film uh, when he saw it. And also, um, has he kept in contact uh, with any or many of the women? Um, I, I, I kind of feel like he's a cool playboy kind of character. So he's going to be sort of just popping out to see everyone now and again. Yeah, before the, the pandemic, he was going like one for months to visit them. And and the retirement home, it's very far off his house. It's like one hour by bus and he take the bus and he went to see them. And now he speak like all weeks uh, with them and he update us about how are they in the retirement home. But he really feel them as their friends, yeah. And he saw the film, but the problem with this is like, I cannot see the film with him. So with Marcela, we have like a Zoom with him to know how he feel, but I would love to feel his reaction in a theater, but he saw it in the computer. So yeah, um, that was a, a problem, but I think that for him it was, he told me like it was super painful to leave some things again about his period of his life because he was like recently a widower and he told me that was super uh, weird for them to go back to that um, situation. And uh, no, but he, he loved it. Like he really, really, really loved it. And he loved to see like his friends um, yeah, no, he, he loved it, but I, I cannot see the, I cannot say, I, I hear only his impressions. I don't feel it with him. So it's different, I, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, COVID and obviously there are many new levels to this film of, of why it should be seen by people as an attempt to understand the levels of loneliness that some people feel. And I've got a final question here. This is from uh, Carla Renata. 
With COVID-19, there's more loneliness and despair for the elderly now more than ever. What can we do to boost their spirits and keep them positive in such a scary time in history? Just, I know it's a very big question to end with, but... You, I'll just say that Maite's original hope was that at the end of the film, everyone would want to call up their grandparents and their parents and, and, and reconnect. So it seems like the, now we're supercharged by uh, COVID to be more mindful and not let people slip too far away from us. Which is yeah, and what is Chris saying? It led when we were premiered at Sundance and the pandemic was not in our eyes. We say all the time, you must, uh, let's call your parents or let's call your grandparents. And I feel that after this month, every, everybody's calling in some way, the grandparents or grandmothers. Also in the retirement home, they told us like the people it's calling more than before after the pandemic. So in some way we were thinking in, in make a film to open eyes. And now I think that the people open eyes and these films go like deep in that uh, new vision of the old age that nobody was conscious about in some way. And for us, it's, we always say that, uh, that the retirement homes must need to exist, but we need to construct with them. Like if you decide to put your parents or grandparents in a retirement home, it's like you are part of that retirement home. Also, you have to construct that world and to be present because they're going to give the things that they need, but not love. It's like, it's your work. Yeah. I guess this is one of the elements of, of this current time that we hope, unlike COVID, doesn't last, is that people don't close their eyes once again, that they, they actually continue to maintain conversations and links with the older generation. Yeah. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully getting to know Sergio will even reinforce that more. Yeah, for sure. Um, unfortunately, we are going to have, have to wrap up this event. Before I do say thank you to our guests, I just want to let you know of two upcoming BAFTA online Q&As. Tomorrow, Wednesday, the 23rd of September, director Eva Riley and lead actor Frankie Box will be discussing their collaboration on the dance drama Perfect Ten. And then next week, next Wednesday, the 30th of September, writer-director Chinoye Chukwu and star Alfred Woodard will be discussing their film Clemency with BAFTA head of programs Maria Kardabai. Um, thank you to Dogwoof and to BAFTA for organizing this event. But most of all, thank you so much, Maita, Marcella, Carolyn, Julie, and Christopher. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.